Thank you to Boxu for sponsoring this video. More on them later. We all eventually face our own demise, but perhaps one of the most horrifying ways to die is at the hands of another human. Student Renee Hartfelt would meet her untimely end in this fashion, and all due to the insanely dark and twisted actions of Issei Sagawa. Actions which, unfortunately, he would never pay for. Welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. My name is Adrian, and in this video we're diving into the case of Issei Sagawa. And honestly folks, this has to be one of the most disturbing cases I've ever covered from Japan. By the way, I post solved, unsolved and strange cases here on a weekly basis, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So please, pull up a seat, grab a coffee and sit back. This is the case of Issei Sagawa. Although our case eventually takes us to France, we begin the story in Kobe, located in the Hyogo Prefecture of Japan. Found 300 miles west of Japan's capital, Tokyo, Hyogo is found towards the end of Honshu's southwestern flank. Scratching the surface, Hyogo is known for Himeji Castle and its wide range of onsen resorts and towns. But there's much more to Hyogo than meets the eye. Its capital, Kobe, contains one of Japan's largest seaports. And the prefecture of Hyogo is very affluent when it comes to academia, with multiple research institutes such as Riken and Spring 8. And when it comes to food, there is a lot to feast your eyes on. The undisputed champion of food in Hyogo prefecture is Kobe beef. And close behind are several local favourites such as Akashiyaki, Ikanago no Kogini, and a local comfort, the fluffy moist pastry named Sweet Mermaid. While we're on the topic of Japanese food, I'd love to take a moment to share a very special package sent by my friends over at Boksu. Honestly, I am super excited to talk about this. So, what exactly is Boksu? It's a monthly subscription service that delivers premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings straight from Japan to your door. And every month, Boksu features a new theme providing a unique gourmet journey through Japan. The first Boksu you will receive is called Seasons of Japan. It's curated by their snack experts to bring you a taste of Japan's four seasons, and of course, a taste of what a year of Boksu would be like. This month's theme is Boksu Tanjobi, as Boksu are now celebrating six years in business. Happy birthday, Boksu! Each Boksu is packed with many interesting snacks, and it comes with a booklet that tells you all about the theme, where the snacks came from, details on all the flavours, and a few Japanese words and phrases too. Boksu partners with many local family snack makers, many of which have been around for over a hundred years and this ensures that you get genuine and authentic selections. But seriously folks, Japanese snacks are in a whole league of their own, and Boksu captures this notion perfectly. And having access to real, authentic Japanese mochi is a real treat to me. This month even has a pastry from Hyogo Prefecture, which if you ask me, goes perfect with coffee. So if you want to try some awesome Japanese snacks and support my channel, click the link in the description below and use my code COFFEE to get $15 off your first Boksu order. And thank you, Boksu, for sponsoring today's video. And back to the story at hand, it's near the city of Kobe that Issei Sagawa was born. Born on April 26, 1949, he arrived on planet Earth only four years after World War II. But despite being born into a country that was deeply injured, exhausted, and financially poor, Issei would experience quite the opposite. He had a great childhood, which for the most part was relatively carefree. Not only did his parents love him dearly, but the family was also extremely wealthy. His father, Akira Sagawa, was the president of Karita Water Industries, a company that nowadays has over 5,000 employees and a 200 billion yen revenue. And his grandfather happened to be a successful editor for the Asahi Shimbun, one of Japan's largest newspaper publishers. Surrounded by farms and nature, Issei experienced the simple yet peaceful way of life. But unfortunately, this didn't come without its own myriad of problems. Issei was born extremely prematurely, so much that medical professionals didn't think he had a chance to survive. And to add to this, he also immediately developed enteritis, a small intestinal disease. As a result, he was short, frail, and even partially stunted, something that would carry on with him into adulthood. Issei was a very peculiar child. In first grade, he became fascinated by girls and other boys, but not in the way that you'd normally imagine. It was around this time that Issei began to fantasize about eating the thighs of his classmates, amongst other various parts too. Through his introverted personality and inability to play sports well, Issei found a deep interest in reading and literature. And not only was this interest approved by both of his parents, but it would also serve him well when it came to academics. 
Moving into his young adulthood, he attended Wako University before moving on to Kwanzaa Gakuen University to obtain a master's degree in English literature. And as he aged, Issei developed a curious fascination with foreign women. This was all despite his short and frail frame. At the age of 24, and while attending his academic course at Wako University, he noticed a Western woman walk by. She was tall, blonde, and German, and a reoccurring detail, but he was particularly drawn to her thighs. One other notable detail, but she also seemed to live in the same block of apartments as his grandmother. This intrigued Issei. He knew the apartment complex very well. It was under this realisation that Issei decided to break into her apartment. He would be able to escape relatively easily with thanks to his local knowledge, which was a necessary part to his plan, as the intention was to kill her and run away with some of her flesh. And so, late one night, Issei crept into the woman's apartment. However, his plans were thwarted, and after accidentally waking her up, she screamed before she pushed him to the ground. Following these actions, Issei Saga was arrested by police before being charged with attempted sexual assault, and unknown to them, he didn't reveal his true intentions to authorities. Lucky for Issei, but with a family with never-ending pockets of money, his father paid a settlement grant to the victim in return for Issei's charges being dropped, and as a result, his criminal record remained clean. The altercation caused distress and anger within Issei's immediate family. However, the cost to his actions wouldn't fall much further than a simple slap on the wrist, and this in time would lead to terrible consequences. On April the 26th, 1977, which just so happened to be his birthday, Issei left Tokyo on a flight to Paris, France. The move was academic, as while here, he wanted to complete a PhD in French literature at Sorbonne University. At least to the Japanese population, Paris is one of the most desired travel destinations, only being beaten by Hawaii. In fact, Japanese citizens typically idolise Paris so much that it can never live up to its name. There is even a psychiatric condition named after this, called Paris Syndrome, where many individuals exhibit a great sense of disappointment once they eventually do visit Paris. To put it short, Paris often fails to live up to Japanese expectations. Nevertheless, Paris is an iconic city, and it's internationally recognised for its historic museums, beautiful architecture, bustling streets, and of course, the Eiffel Tower. And it's here, in the capital of France, that Issei Sagawa met René Hartevelt. Originally from Holland, René was a Dutch student who had moved to Paris so she could learn French literature at Sorbonne University. René was an attractive woman, and standing at 5 foot 10, she was almost 1 foot taller when compared to Issei. She had an interest in poetry, and likely a contributing factor to studying in Paris, but she was described as being a romantic at heart. With an infectious personality carefully placed behind her soft yet contrasting eyes, she was well liked amongst her peers. Through their academic studies, Issei and Renee would slowly turn from classmates into casual friends, and although they would occasionally meet for coffee and help each other with lecture notes, there was nothing more. Now, eventually, Issei earned Renee's trust. The two began to have dinner together in their own homes while revising for their exams. And as this friendship with the beautiful Western woman blossomed, Issei was finding it more and more difficult to control his dark fantasies. At least in his own mind, he had long established that eventually he would have to give in to his desires and kill someone, and he'd been making gradual efforts for quite some time. While residing in Paris, Issei started to bring sex workers home to his apartment very often, and although he planned to shoot them so he could eat them, he'd always freeze up and fail to pull the trigger. Whether moving to a European city for his education was a conscious decision to fulfil his desires, or simply to accentuate them, we don't know. But it seems that the answer was both. On June the 11th, 1981, Issei invited Renee over to his apartment for dinner. Wanting to do well in her studies, she agreed to do some additional work with him. Apparently, she had missed an optional assignment in translating poetry. But of course, Issei was there to help. This was their second evening in a row together, and much like the first one, this evening was rather uneventful. But unfortunately, it wouldn't remain that way, as Issei had plans. Issei really liked Renée, but not in the conventional or orthodox way. He found her to be beautiful, and he admired her good health. And sickeningly, he believed that by consuming her, he would absorb her energy, something which in return would provide him good health and beauty. As Renée began to work at the desk located in his living room, Issei crept away to retrieve something, all under the guise of cooking up dinner. With her back to the room, views of apartment buildings across the Parisian street complemented a cool breeze flowing through the window, and with that said, she began to translate poetry out of a book. 
That's when Issei silently crept up behind her, and unbeknownst to Renee, he had a rifle. Without her having any clue as to what was going on, Issei drew his rifle, aimed it at the back of her head, and pulled the trigger. As a result of his actions, he fainted immediately. After regaining consciousness, he made the decision to carry on with his plan, and briefly speaking of the details, but Issei used Renee's body for… other means, before eventually cutting up and consuming multiple parts of her body. He then refrigerated several more parts, before initiating his cover-up plan. Needless to say, the man was insane, but he had to be creative in order to discreetly remove Renee's body without being caught. After all, he was in the middle of an extremely busy city, quite identifiable by nature, and logistically ill-equipped. Issei was smart in his own way, but logistically speaking, he wasn't ready for this. The problem is, with Paris being so hot in the middle of June, he had to remove the body before it became noticeable. He therefore decided to buy two large travel bags, and two days after murdering Renee, he put her body inside these bags before hailing for a taxi. Located towards the western flank of Paris lies a park named Bois de Boulogne, and within this park are several lakes. Issei often visited Bois de Boulogne to walk, study and relax, and being relatively familiar with the place, he decided to get rid of Renée's body by sinking the bags in the lake. As expected, his taxi driver arrived at 8pm, and with Issei being too frail and weak, his driver picked his bags off the ground and put them into the boot of his car. They were extremely heavy, and with twisted irony, his cab driver even joked, asking if there was a human body inside it. Issei awkwardly laughed, explaining it was books. It seemed as if Issei had miscalculated his plan, because although it was 8pm, Paris was still drenched with daylight. This was a problem. With the sun still out and many people taking to the park, he had no way to discreetly get rid of Renée's body. And rather than head back to his apartment, he accepted the fair price and got out of the taxi with his travel bags. And needless to say, many French citizens spotted him walking around the park. To add to his scuppered plans, Issei seemed to become easily distracted. He took a few moments to take in the summer sunset. In this process, he left his bags unattended several feet behind him. And when he eventually turned around, he saw a man poking at the suitcase. Is this yours? the stranger asked, in which Issei replied with, no. Moments later, the puzzled man opened one of the bags. A woman behind him began to scream just seconds later. Issei calmly walked away as a shocked crowd began to form around the suitcase. His opportunity to dispose of Renee's body had failed, and now the question on if he would ever get caught began to plague his mind. His concerns wouldn't last very long, as only four days later, French authorities raided his property and formally charged him with the murder of Renee Hartfelt. Contrary to how you'd imagine a killer to react, Issei was actually relieved to have been caught. At least now, in his mind, he would be able to talk to someone about his desires. And when officers questioned him, his answer was simple and emotionless, saying, I killed her, so I could eat her flesh. As expected with cases including foreigners, a long and bespoke legal process followed. After murdering Renee and even admitting to his crimes, Issei was held for two years to await trial. And again, lucky for him, his wealthy father threw a lot of money into a good lawyer for his defence. But this trial would never entirely come his way, as eventually, Issei Saga was found to be legally insane and unfit to stand trial, and instead, the judge ordered him to be indefinitely held in a French mental institution. But this was only the beginning to a series of disappointing events. You see, considering the nature and accidental publicity of his crime, the story of Issei Sagawa caught a lot of attention within French media, and once the public heard he would indefinitely stay within their mental institutions, they were enraged. The French public didn't want to waste their hard-earned money or taxes on this man, and following a national outcry to deport him, the government complied. Issei was therefore deported back to Japan. All of this sounds fair enough, but since he was found legally unfit to stand trial in the French judicial system, his murder charges were dropped. And since they were dropped, all court documentation which held information of his crimes were both sealed, and therefore not legally allowed to be released to foreign authorities, including Japan. Unfortunately, this backed Japan's own judicial system into a corner, and since Japanese authorities had no robust case against Issei Sagawa, they had no choice but to let him walk free. Granted, he was checked into the Matsuzawa Psychiatric Hospital located in Tokyo, where he was then diagnosed with a personality disorder, but on August 12, 1986, Issei Sagawa was checked out of this hospital without any sufficient treatment. And, can you believe it, he has been free ever since. 
Issei Sagwa has been a free man, free to leave his home, and free to walk the streets of Tokyo for 36 long years. And in that time, a lot has changed. Probably one of the only satisfying results of being allowed to walk free. But with a murderous history and being declared as insane, Issei found it extremely hard to find any employment. And with no job, came no income. But as his professional ambitions ground to a halt, his public image would take a new direction. And soon enough, Japanese media became interested in him. Japanese culture can often be seen as strange when compared to Western standards. And this part of the story is certainly no different. Issei's first opportunity of work arose when a Japanese publisher asked him if he could write an article about his crimes. And in return, they offered him the equivalent of 20,000 US dollars. This gave Issei an idea. He was already well versed in the world of writing and literature. So, why not write a book? With this notion, he began to work on various essays, novels, and articles, making a name and an income over his own heinous crimes. He would eventually create more than 20 books for himself and various publishers. He illustrated and sold portraits of beautiful women, and he would even go on to make Lolita Manga for a publisher, which in this instance was a sexual comic based off of his murder of Rene Hartevelt. Issei became even more of a media spectacle after this. As time moved on, public sensitivity around his crimes dulled. He was given the opportunity to work with various video producers, which led to several videos being published, including videos of him performing badly in sports, playing Wolf in Little Red Riding Hood, and even eating chicken under the impression of being a cannibal. One of his most disturbing jobs came when he agreed to co-lead in an adult film, if you understand what I mean. The caveat to this was that he would only reveal that he was a murderer after he had sex with a woman, which surely would have caused some psychological scarring. Moving on to the more concerning elements of this story, and you've probably guessed it by now, but it ultimately appears that Issei has never learned his lesson. In fact, even to this day, he admits that he still has the urge to eat other women. In the years after returning to Japan, he often stole money from his parents in order to chase and pay women for their time. And although some clocked on to who he was, not all of them did. The lack of punishment and penalty to this man's actions is honestly mind-blowing. He has since spent many decades in his own home, with his own comforts. His home is also filled with photos of his victim and the crime scene he once created. Which, if you ask me, is one of the most apathetic actions a human could do. In the more recent years, Issei Sagwa claims to have graduated from Western women. And instead, he now apparently finds interest in Japanese women, specifically from the southern island of Okinawa. Time and time again, he has highlighted his concerns of one day killing another woman. But with no official court documentation ever being released from French authorities, Japanese authorities have no legal standing to arrest the man. He remains free to this very day. To add to his strangeness, Issei now also feels the urge to be killed and eaten. And of course, he's highlighted many times that he'd prefer to be a victim to a beautiful cannibalistic woman. His philosophy, but this is the only thing that can truly save him from what he refers to as the Beast, which currently remains dormant inside him. Although it's terrifying that Issei Sagawa is technically allowed to roam the streets of Tokyo and beyond, in more recent years he has suffered several illnesses and injuries, which in return have resulted in permanent damage to his nervous system. He now lives alone, and requires assistance almost daily, which means you likely have nothing to fear when it comes to bumping into Issei Sagawa. It seems that, no matter your innocence or punishment, time will slowly erode you away regardless. You know, it's very disturbing to see Issei get away with his actions, and not that he ever will, but even if he were to be punished now in his old age, he still managed to get a good 36 years of freedom. And all in the meanwhile, Rene never managed to experience the entirety of her life. Honestly, I wish I could share more information about her, but with her death happening more than 10 years before I was born, there's barely any information available. I've seen this a few times in the cases that I've covered, but it seems that the legal technicalities around extradition and international justice need to be strengthened. Issei Sagwa quite literally got away with murder. And so concludes the case of Issei Sagwa and, sadly, of Rene Hartfeld. Thank you so much for being here with me in this video. I hope you found this case interesting, or at the very least, insightful. If you did, then please stick around, and I'll see you again real soon in the next video. And thank you so much to Boxu for sponsoring today's video. Getting a new Boxu in the mail is honestly one of my favourite things. I'll leave a link if you'd like to try it out, just use my code COFFEE. I can quite literally feel my voice fading as I speak folks, so I'm going to wrap it up here. As always, please share your thoughts in the comment section down below. And until I see you again next time, please remember to look after each other. Goodbye.
Bois de Boulogne, Bois de Boulogne, Bois de Boulogne, Bois de Boulogne. Located to the western flank of Paris lies a park named Bois. <laughs>